if you can't understand me, please say, um, tell me to repeat myself. I was originally an administrator of the Facebook public group, and now I am involved in the private group. Um, and it's such an honor for me to be involved with everyone. So Florencia, it's your turn. Uh, your turn. You're up, Florencia. <laughs> oh, okay, my turn. <laughs> well, I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in 2014, and this is when I found the group because I couldn't find any other patient that, that had the same disease. Uh, well, my family, they didn't understand very well what the treatment was about. They were confused with the chemo, why chemo? So if he, she has chemo, then she's not going to need surgery. Uh, like, really, do you have kind of bone, things like that. Uh, and it, it was, I, I found a lot of support in Amanda, actually, because I, I didn't know anyone in the UK. Now I am more in touch with the Bone Cancer Research Trust. And I met people, but they are in England. I, I live in Scotland, so it's a little bit far away. So then I started to get more involved in the group and uh, and I was asked to be an admin. And, you know, uh, we know that we are support for people because it's, uh, this is, sarcoma is called like the lonely cancer in the UK because it's, it's so rare and, and people don't, don't know anything about it. Thank you, Florencia. Taylor? Sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Taylor Kusher. Um, I'm a clinical project manager with Count Me In, which is the organization that is running the osteosarcoma project. So I manage the day-to-day -day of the project, um, have been involved with the team um, in the build and launch, which we're excited to tell you more about. Um, so my role involves kind of intersecting with the scientist, um, the Scientific Advisory Council, patient communities, and patients like Anne who have helped us in the build of the project just to make it um, kind of as, as good as it can be. Um, and then also work with a team that helps then acquire medical records, tumor samples, saliva samples, so we can generate data on the project. So we're really excited to share more with you today. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Corey Painter. Um, I just wanna, I wanna thank Anne and everybody else for organizing this opportunity for us to all connect. I wish so badly I could see all of your faces. Um, so know that I'm trying to look very deeply into my computer at you, but I can't <laughs> see you. Um, I am a scientist by training. I work at the Broad Institute and helped conceive of and launch um, this initiative called Count Me In, where we build these patient partnered genomics research projects like we're gonna talk about today in osteosarcoma. I happen to be 10 years out from my own diagnosis of angiosarcoma and feel uh, very committed to bringing resources to um, all sarcomas and all rare cancers. Thank you. Okay, so um, please tell us about the, what is the osteosarcoma project and how can we help? Yeah, Great. we have so, some slides that we'll share, so I will pull those up now. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this initiative called Count Me In. Um, and the Osteosarcoma Project is one of six projects that have come out of Count Me In. Um, so without further ado, we'll talk about what these projects are. Um, the, the notion of generating patient partner genomics projects really kind of started at the Broad Institute well before I came there about five years ago with the leadership who had noticed, or not noticed, but come to realize that we as a biomedical community are missing the vast majority of samples that may help us understand cancer. Turns out that about 85%, and this is different for um, osteosarcoma, but for most adult cancers, it turns out that 85% of um, patients are treated in community settings, meaning like like myself, I was I was diagnosed at UMass Medical School where I was a graduate student and they don't do angiosarcoma research, but my sample was taken out of my body and evaluated there and then put on a shelf 
And so it went, it was needed in order to diagnose me, but then it didn't do anything to further our understanding of my cancer or anybody else's. And just like me, about 85% of other cancer patients experience the same thing, where that initial biopsy and or resection may not be used to understand what's going on at the genomic level within their disease. So most patient samples and data have been readily available for study. But we live in an era now where everything has changed. And for the younger folks who may have been born into this era, it, it's gonna, it may feel like, wait, it's always been this way. But trust me when I say I had a typewriter before I had a computer. And you know, I, it's only been really within the last 10 or 15 years that we've all had the ability to connect with each other through the internet on um, social media, and through other methods. Before then, you couldn't really do very large scale studies where you could try to cast a really wide net and capture a bunch of people who live all over the place because we didn't have those le that level of um, interconnectedness that we have as a result of technology and social media today. So before I started, the leadership at the Broad had been asking themselves this question. What if we could generate a massive publicly available database of clinical and genomic, molecular and patient reported data in cancer to enable researchers to find patterns in the data and help accelerate discoveries and the development of new treatment strategies? And I was brought to help them kind of conceive of and launch that through the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. The director of Count Me In is Dr. Nikhil Wagle, who's a medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber um, in Cancer Institute and an uh, institute member at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And he is just deeply committed to trying to understand and study metastatic breast cancer. And he had started well in advance of bringing me on board, talking to advocates and individual patients wherever he had the opportunity to cross paths and ask them this question, like, would you join me if we were to build something that engaged patients in the process of, of building a genomics project, um, launching a genomics project, and then seeing it through over time? And so many people just said, absolutely, of course, we, we want to see progress made in our disease and we'll do anything. And so with the help of so many patients that he met, and then I subsequently joined and met we built this website and this, the infrastructure for a study called the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. This is a study that lives online and you can join from your smartphone or a tablet or your computer by going to mbcproject.org and you can just click on the count me in and it takes you through a series of questions that asks about your experience with um, metastatic breast cancer and then it brings you to an online consent form. Okay, and then, I found um, this on the web for medical release form. So um, we launched this in October of uh, 2015. And so far, so good. This is a map um, made recently of the women and men, because men do get metastatic breast cancer too, though to a lesser extent. Um, and this shows the people along um, all over the United States and Canada, um, which are the two countries that we can enroll from who have joined the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. The, if you did an overlay of this with a map of the population of the United States, they would match almost identically. And so it does, it's not that people in the Northeast have more um, metastatic breast cancer, it's that this is just where the people actually live. And it's a representation showing that unlike most studies, which only draw from one geographical location and or you know around a small area, um, this really enables and empowers patients from all over the place, no matter where they live, to come and be counted into the research paradigm. What we do after a patient enrolls is if they provide consent, we collect um, their copies of their medical records, we send them a, a box that has a, a, a collection vial for saliva, in some cases, we'll ask if they want to provide blood. And if they enable us, we will ask if there is extra leftover tissue. And once we get all of this information together, we perform sequencing on, this, on the biological samples in order to understand what's going on in their normal DNA, as well as the DNA in their tumors. Once we have that, we want our, our goal as 
our goal here is to take all of that data and just put it out for the world to be able to use and, dis and make discoveries on. This is not um, a typical research project where we are toiling away at the lab and trying to make discoveries and publish on them. Our goal at Count Me In is really to be a data generator and sharer of that information for all biomedical scientists to use at the same time. We, um, as a result, can hopefully get people that don't even study these cancers, like people that don't study metastatic breast cancer or osteosarcoma, but may be interested in genomics, to become aware of this data and then use it. So to do that, we deposit the data, we, we take away all of the information that can identify a person. So their name is gone, their birth date is gone, even their date of diagnosis is not part of the data. So we um, take away the identifiable information and couple it with their genomic information. And then we put it in places like CBIO portal um, and the genomic data commons, as well as other um, online portals with hoping to get maximal amount of engagement from the scientific community. So we, it looks like this was successful for the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. What we hadn't shown, but that is an important caveat, is that there's over 20 publications that cite the data that we've already um, put into the public domain from the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. Patients are super engaged, and it, it, it was really um, successful from every metric that we could imagine. And then the question came, can we do this in other cancers? And so we wanted to see if we could do it in a super rare cancer, if we could do this in um, a cancer that had a high mortality rate. And uh, we chose my cancer, angiosarcoma. And you can see here, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. It has one of the poorest prognosis of um, all soft tissue sarcomas. There's about 300 of us diagnosed each year. And um, it drop, drops off uh, precipitously after the first year um, with only with less than a 20% survival rate, no matter what stage you come um, into the diagnosis with. So I turned to my uh, patient community, which was in uh, Facebook, and asked them, I said, if you are alive with this disease and willing to donate your medical records and um, some of your leftover samples for research, click like. And within an hour, 91 patients said that they would join by clicking like which is absolutely remarkable for such an incredibly rare cancer and a testament to what I'm sure everybody listening to this fully understands and appreciates. What happens when you have something so rare, but then you find other people just like you, you know? And it, you, you have um, just a kinship with these people. You all are on the same page. You all understand what the struggles are in terms of trying to get research for your disease and you rally. And that's what we saw with the angiosarcoma project. So we launched this in 2017 and to our great surprise, over 500 women and men with angiosarcoma have joined over the past um, two and a half years, which is absolutely, again, remarkable. We also have a portal for the angiosarcoma project that we built um, for loved ones who had lost somebody to the disease. We feel that loved ones possess so much information. They are information carriers. And oftentimes, if they've lost somebody to the disease, um, there's just no closure, you know, and, and nobody wants to be able to help more than somebody who has been in the thick of it and wants to try to ensure that other people don't have to walk down the same path that they did. So we developed part of the angiosarcoma project to enable loved ones to talk about the experiences that um, somebody that they loved had gone through with the cancer. The work that we were able to, um, the data that we were able to put into the public domain showed um, some immediate signals that we were able to pick up on. And we, um, our internal team here at the Broad Institute that included um, several of the scientists and um, project managers and clinical um, coordinators put together a manuscript that was just recently published in Nature Medicine. When we told the patients that were in the project about this, they had some really touching sentiments that they shared with us about being in tears, knowing that other people wouldn't have to go down the same road, um, saying that miracles do happen, really being very touched that they were able to contribute to discoveries that were then dis, um, disseminated to everybody in the world that, he's, that reads the scientific literature. 
So we had the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project and the Angiosarcoma Project, and we were able to subsequently launch several other projects. So we are now open in metastatic prostate cancer, esophageal and stomach cancer, and brain cancer. And most recently, we built one for osteosarcoma. So thanks, Corey. I'll pick it up from there. So we worked um, really closely. Um, all of our projects work closely with members of uh, project advisory councils made up of patients, advocates, and caregivers and loved ones who have been affected by osteosarcoma. And these folks, um, as you can you probably see a familiar face here, um, these folks help inform every step of the um, project design from the colors that we're using, the website design, the word choice, the questions that we ask patients to fill out um, in a survey when they are signing up for the project. So um, we really, you know, wouldn't be able to do this without um, these, these folks and we're so grateful for their participation. Similarly, uh, we also lean on a group of scientific advisors who can help inform us on, you know, kind of the the most needed areas in osteosarcoma, what should we be looking for, what are interesting um, cohorts of patients um, and samples that they would want to study and look into. So we are really fortunate to be led in this effort by um, Dr. Katie Janeway and Dr. Brian Crompton, and we also have added several other scientific advisors to our council since we launched the project. Um, and so we, we really refer to them to help shape kind of the scientific outputs of um, the data that we're able to generate from the project. So the osteosarcoma project was um, really interesting and exciting because doctors Janeway and Crompton had actually approached our team and said, these are the key areas of impact that we think you could make a difference in if we had a project in osteosarcoma. And some of the things that they had identified were um, helping to characterize different subtypes of osteosarcoma, thinking about um, tumor evolution and being able to collect samples over time and see how um, tumors may be changing with treatments. Um, and then also being able to identify new targetable therapies. So in looking at not only the tumor samples that we get, but also potentially blood samples um, and rare tissues types that most studies wouldn't usually access, we might be able to identify new targets for osteosarcoma treatments or for folks who are at, in more high-risk groups. So the Osteosarcoma Project is open, as Corey mentioned, to anyone who lives in the United States and Canada. Um, you can join if you've ever been diagnosed at any point in time, um, whether you've been diagnosed or your child has been diagnosed. Um, you can join the study to complete surveys and donate access to your medical records. We'll go and get those from your hospitals and institutions. Um, you can also provide, provide us with a saliva sample. And then you have a choice to opt into also providing a blood sample and allowing us to access um, stored tumor samples as well for sequencing. If uh, your child or another loved one has passed away from osteosarcoma, you can also participate in the study. Um, similar to the angiosarcoma project, we have a survey where we can collect information from loved ones about their um, ex their person's experience with osteosarcoma so that we're kind of capturing all of that information um, and making sure that those folks who are information carriers and have the expertise of what it was like um, can share that with us as well. So participating in the project is really easy. Um, this is kind of a lot of the same steps I already outlined for you, but if you do go to our website, there's also a video that we have with some, hope, some familiar faces in the osteosarcoma community that kind of explain each step of the, the process um, for patients and what it's like to be involved in the project. Um, I wanted to pull up two of our more, most frequently asked questions here. Um, we do have a list of frequently asked questions on our website as well. Um, and one question we often get is how is this different than commercial or clinical genomic testing, and also um, if people are able to, if we're able to give results back to patients, um, which our testing is done, our sequencing is done in a research grade lab and not a 
a clinical grade lab or a CLIA lab. And so we are not able to return results back to individual patients, but rather return kind of in aggregate de-identified results to those uh, scientific repositories and portals that Corey mentioned earlier. And that's really how we're sharing the data with researchers. We anonymize it, remove all the identifying information, um, and make men, much of it public um, through some of the portals Corey mentioned, but then also there are other portals where scientists need particular um, uh, access or um, have requirements in order to be able to access sort of deeper levels of the data that we generate through the project. If you're interested in seeing what this looks like, um, you can check out the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. Um, we have a page all about data release and where the data is going and what we've released. And I, that's a really great example of sort of how we've been able to collect data and how we're putting it out um, into the world about the project. So we launched the Osteosarcoma Project on February 28th this year. Um, in that time, we have had 105 patients register from across the United States and Canada. You can see them represented here as uh, purple dots. And then we also have 45 people who have begun surveys about their loved ones that they've lost to osteosarcoma, and they're represented here in orange. So um, we're not quite covering the entire country like the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project yet, but we're still in very early stages here. Um, so now I have a couple charts kind of about enrollment um, and sort of what we're already seeing from folks who are participating in the project. Um, so I wanted to share those with you so you can get a sense of the type of information that we're collecting um, and how we're taking a look at it. So this is um, just a chart of, of the number of patients enrolling over time. I mean, we've bucketed it here into two different groups. In blue are people who have registered um, with their child, so their child has been diagnosed with osteosarcoma, and the line in orange represents people who themselves have been diagnosed with osteosarcoma at any point in time. So our study right now is about half and half between these two groups, um, which we had shared with our scientific advisory council, and they were really excited to see that because often it can be challenging to um, have a study that looks at both of these groups at the same time. We also, one of the questions that we ask um, patients and, and parents when they register for the study um, is what age you were when you were diagnosed with osteosarcoma. So you can see here, again, those two groups in blue, those who have children who are diagnosed, and in orange, those who were diagnosed themselves. So um, some folks you know, were diagnosed, you can see in their teens, um, but actually have now participated in the study as adults, which is, really nice to see. And we have also um, some participants who have been diagnosed later in life, um, kind of outside the normal expectations, um, which is another group that our scientific council was excited to see enrolling in the project. We ask a lot of different questions um, during uh, enrollment, during the survey. And so one of the questions that we asked um, that we wanted to, that I wanted to showcase here was, uh, it's how, how long were you experiencing symptoms of osteosarcoma before you were diagnosed? Um, and this is broken down by different buckets of age um, of when, when people were diagnosed. So this is just one way that we can start to kind of slice and dice and investigate um, the information that we're capturing. And this, when we begin to get um, tumor samples and sequencing data, we'll be able to sort of pair that and look for other um, patterns in the information. We also ask about locations of osteosarcoma. Um, this is whether or not people are currently in treatment um, based on where their osteosarcoma is located. And we have a lot of participants in the study so far who have no evidence of disease. And we also wanted to touch on, um, you know, this being a sort of crazy time in the world right now. Um, obviously, Corey and I are both in our homes, and the rest of our team is also working from home right now. Um, but the project is online, and patients can always join 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you can join the project, sign up, sign the consent form, and fill out all of the information um, whenever you are interested. We're also continuing to engage with our scientific community and process and analyze all of the data that we've already collected. 
but right now all of our lab operations are on hold. So we are not requesting tumor samples from hospitals and institutions so that we don't overwhelm them um, so they can focus on um, you know, dealing with COVID-19. Also the Broad Institute sequencing platform has converted into a testing center that can process um, tests for Boston area COVID patients. So um, we are on hold right now in terms of sending out saliva kits or blood kits to patients to collect those. Um, and so if you were to sign up right now, you would see in an email, oh, we'll send you a saliva kit soon. But those operations are on pause and we will reach back out once we're able to resume normal operations in the future. So there, while you're seeing Corey and I's faces here, there is an enormous team of um, you know, all the project advisory council, our scientific advisory council, and then these other two columns are many of the folks at the Broad Institute and Count Me In who are also involved in this project. Um, it takes a village to do something like this. And we're so grateful to also everyone in the osteosarcoma community that's already engaged with us, that's helped shape and inform and build this project with us. Um, if you're interested in you know, following us, communicating with us, you've got questions, we have a mailing list, um, you can also always email us, and then we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so you can find us in those places. So I'll turn it back over to you, Anne, for questions. You're on mute. Yeah, Anne, you're still muted. Hold on. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm actually going to turn it over to Amanda first for uh, questions, and then um, and then Florencia, if you can maybe just go one in one and um, see how many we can get through. And if we, um, our plan is to end at 3:45. If if we haven't gotten to everybody's questions, or and you have additional questions, if you could just email us at info at mibagents.org. Um, we'll take those questions and get them answered for you. Um, we'll put them on our social media account. So if you don't follow us, it's MIB Agents is available on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. We'll put the answers there. In the meantime, we do have some questions that Amanda and um, Florencia have been gathering. So Amanda, would you um, ask a question, please, on behalf of your community? Many of the questions were already answered by Taylor and Corey, so thank you. Um, I'd like to know if the if siblings or children of the OS patient would give you any beneficial data towards the research. I have two kids. I didn't say before, I was diagnosed in 1987 with OS and 2010 with breast cancer and 2018 with AOS. So yes, thanks. But um, will my children who are 15 and 17 benefit you if you had their or my sister even, mm -hmm. you have their genetic information. It's such a good question and I really appreciate um, you asking it and I just uh, wish that luck hadn't chosen you so many times for all of the things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question and it has come up and we would be open to this. Uh, the, the thought here is that maybe there's something in the inherited DNA that could give us clues about osteosarcoma um, and or you know other cancers that somebody with osteosarcoma may um, also be susceptible to. Um, we are open to it. It's not part of the current project, but it is a conversation uh, that we're having. And one of the things about these projects is they evolve over time. So just because we don't have that as part of the project now doesn't mean that it might not become part of it in the future. I do think there's a lot of valuable information from having family members join. And as we start talking more deeply with the scientific advisory committee, we will make a call as to whether or not and how we would include family members um, down the road. So thank you for asking that. I have a follow-up question. 
with air last my time is limited. If I pass away before like this, well, I would love for my kids or my sister to somehow get involved. Right now, they're not involved in any of this. Yeah. But would they be able to get, well, not only my family, but we could get hit by a car tomorrow. Yeah. So anyone involved would be able to follow through with them if? It's a really good question. I actually had not thought of that. Um, we don't have a mechanism for that right now, but we could certainly look into it. Um, we right, right now we do have the loved ones portal. So, but it wouldn't necessarily connect like yeah. you, if you were in the project with somebody else who came and told us about you, there would be a connection that was lost there. So we will have to think more deeply about that, but it's a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up and we can, um, we can have that as part of future discussions. Yeah. For 33 years, I wanted to get back. So my kids, I'm sure my sister, even my mom would do anything to help also. Thank you. And I'm sure so many other people. And Florence, do you want to go before I go on to another? Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Uh, because, well, I have the list here of the, of the questions that I had that are relevant uh, for the webinar. Uh, well, I was wondering if you are finding a lot of barriers in terms of, uh, of the research, because in, in the UK, the mm -hmm. scientists were trying to do something similar, but despite uh, having the, the, the patient's consent, they are having a lot of, of, of issues for this type of research. So I'm wondering how is how is that going? It's a it's a great question, and it's um, one of the reasons that we can't just open up internationally. Um, there's so many different laws governing participants' ability to share information, both PHI and genomic information and tissue samples that differ from country to country. And I would um, I think that Europe has some very stringent laws. Um, I cannot remember what the acronym is. It starts with a G. GD, I don't know. Oh, GPDR, yes. That's the one, yes. GPDR, yes. and so, <laughs> yeah, and so I feel like um, it's it's so good to have um, oversight to make sure that patients are being protected, and then the flip side of that coin is sometimes it protects them so much that they can't actually share data that they want to share. It's I had a lot of problem accessing my own medical records yeah, exactly. because exactly. of this. And, and you know, I want to have everything because I'm going to need more surgery in, mm. in the future. Uh, so I, I need to have everything. Yeah. So um, we do not have significant barriers like that in our project, but it does mean that we're limited to the United States and Canada for the time being as we um, search and research what we may be able to do in other countries. I feel like it's my personal desire to try and expand these um, to more countries, especially when the, you have an exceedingly rare cancer like osteosarcoma. It's just so important to make sure that we get as much data as possible. Um, but as you noted, it's very challenging too because different countries just have, they, it's a showstopper when you can't actually collect the data due to law. Um, the issues that we have, we don't have issues like that here. We are able and have permission to collect all of these through our IRB. But we do see attrition along the different steps that you have to take in order to generate all of the data. And I would say that those are the most significant barriers. And so a patient signs up, they provide consent, and they're like, here's my saliva, go. And we're like, okay. And so we'll have a group of people that work um, as part of our team call the hospitals that they listed and say, we have their consent, here's a copy. Can you please send us their medical records? And sometimes they just don't. And so then those same coordinators will call again and again and again. And sometimes we just cannot get those medical records. And in some cases, the hospitals will finally get back to us and say, ooh, we needed this extra form signed. And so then the team will collect that, send it to the patient and do whatever we can in order to get the medical records. Once we get those, we then can read through the medical records and see if, if a patient had provided consent to allow us to collect tissue, we'll go ahead and see if we can get a sample of that. And sometimes hospitals will not be able to provide that and or they won't um, call us back. 
Luckily, the vast majority of uh, these facilities do provide medical records and tissue samples. Um, but it is, a, it is an area that we are always trying to uh, improve our processes around. Okay, um, let's go kind of rapid fire around now because we have several questions on chat and I know of Amanda and Florencia still have quick questions. Amanda, you wanna go ahead? I was gonna mention that a few years ago, I tried getting my um, tumor from Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. to Teresa Beach, and they were not able to get it. Yeah. But I know the normal way of getting um, samples now was saliva or blood. Mm -hmm. For the ALS, I had a bone uh, Core tissue biopsy, mm -hmm. which I believe was a piece of my muscle yeah. taken. Would something like that be valuable to you for this? Or the things that would be valuable to us are saliva and blood, um, and the leftover tumor tissue, but not necessarily other um, tissues that were not in affected by the by the osteosarcoma. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Florencia? Yes, and uh, I wanted to know about uh, if there is any success in, in findings, analyzing the tumors genetically, uh, because I've been reading about this, and um, for example, my osteosarcoma is not, uh, it doesn't have a subtype. There mm -hmm. were a lot of different type of cells. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think this uh, does the tumors more aggressive, if there is a mm -hmm. certain uh, type of cells? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so I'm not, I won't, we first haven't started sequencing anything yet. So we just, we just launched um, like a month and a half ago. And so it'll take us time before we can, you know, we have to um, send a saliva kit out, get that back, request the medical record, get it back, request the tissue sample, get it back, do the sequencing. And at that point, release that data out. So it does, there is a significant lag time between when we launch a study and when we produce data of up to a year or two. So we always try to shorten the time um, as significantly as possible. Um, so that's that's caveat number one. And caveat number two is I'm not an expert in osteosarcoma. I'm um, a helpful player trying to bridge uh, the patient community with uh, Brian and Katie who really know all the types of questions like that. Okay, quick question. This is a, I think this is a good one, especially based on um, the early data that you've gotten and, and that you've shown from David, how will you be able to obtain information from us if we are like Amanda and over 30 plus years out of treatment? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that is a really good question. And, and in some cases, if a, if a tumor has been destroyed at a facility, we won't be able to collect that tumor, but we can collect um, useful information in the saliva and or blood. So if, you've, um, if you were treated over 30 years ago and you are good to go and you've been NED all of these years, if you join, we would still um, send a saliva kit and collect that and analyze it as part of the study, as well as your medical records. What treatments were you on? What's the duration of treatments? And um, you know, one of the things we're, we're going to be able to do is create almost like a natural history of the disease. Um, so the more people that sign up, even the clinical information that we get is very vital and useful for the research community. Thank you for asking that. So really all osteosarcoma data is good osteosarcoma data, even if it's just at the sign up level, when you say I, I was this old at diagnosis and, and this is my outcome, that's all valuable. Very valuable, yes. Um, okay, so we are at 3, 3.45, which is when, when we said we'd be done. Please keep sending your questions and we'll get those answered. Um, the main thing is is to let's be counted and and let's let's inform this research. The brilliant and extraordinary thing is, as as a patient myself and and as part of a, a larger patient community, for years and even in treatment, I remember going, "What can I do?" And like Amanda was just saying, "What can I do?" Like I, I wish the generation before us and the generation before them, but had done something, but they didn't have the ability to do what we can do today. There's never been a better time for discovery. There's never been a better time for everybody to work together truly um, to inform research. And, and now 
the power is in our own hands. We as patients have the power to inform research. It doesn't cost us anything. This is a benevolent program from the Broad Institute to be this bridge for us from the patient community to the, to the researcher community. This research is then not sold. This is available for free to any researcher to, um, to use to find kinder treatments and to get us closer to a cure. Um, it's huge. Please, please, please visit the Osteosarcoma Project um, online. You, you can find a link through our, um, through, our, through our Facebook page and through our website and um, really encourage you to, to do that. And of course, ask questions. If you have questions, let, let's get those answered and, um, and hopefully it's right for you to do this. Um, wanted to say, um, really excited about this Osteobytes program. Um, we have somebody that is likely coming on next week. It turns out a lot of our questions were general osteosarcoma knowledge questions. So we're hoping to have somebody next week, Thursday. Um, so watch this space <laughs> on social media. Um, and we'll also do an email blast as well um, on, on what we're able to come up with for next week, Thursday at three o'clock. The following week, um, on the 23rd, we have the Osteosarcoma Institute. Um, this is an extraordinary group of uh, people who, are, who have been working on osteosarcoma specific research, um, funding it, um, being boots on the ground with the people who are doing the research um, for a long time. And they have a new program that benefits all of us called um, the Osteosarcoma Institute Hotline. This is I can tell you, I know this. I know this night. It's I call it the dark night of the soul when you're you're a patient or your child is a patient and you're you're just going, oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't know the answer to this question. And it, you you wish I know. I wish in those moments that I had somebody I could call that was an expert. We now have that. We now have the osteosarcoma hotline where you can call this number and, and have somebody pick up a nurse navigator with an expertise in osteosarcoma, sarcoma, and, um, and answer your questions. This nurse navigator is backed by the most brilliant uh, physicians uh, in osteosarcoma right now. So it's not just the nurse navigator that's, that's helping you. So they'll be um, here on the 23rd with another, another edition of Osteobytes. And um, following that, uh, we'll have Dr. Mateo Truco on, and we are, we again have the power as the patient community to help inform a, um, an osteosarcoma clinical trial. So what we um, talk, what we, will, what we will be talking about on the 30th is um, really getting the patient community feedback on, um, on you know, whether this, oste whether this osteosarcoma trial is a go or not. Um, finally, if you're facing osteosarcoma, um, you are welcome to go to our website and download a copy of our book, um, which is Osteosarcoma from Our Family to Yours, Support for Osteosarcoma by Osteosarcoma Families, um, and our, our scientific advisory team is on it. Um, it's free. It's a free download, or you can get an actual copy like this one um, for $5 shipping and handling. And um, gosh, I think that's it. So just keep sending us uh, your questions. Um, we'll get back to you on them. And um, if you're interested in the next Osteobytes, just keep following us. Um, thank you very much to the Osteosarcoma Project for the extraordinary work they're doing on our behalf. It is so exciting um, and we appreciate it so much. And thank you to the people who are there for us every single day, Florencia, and Amanda through your Facebook groups, um, you are you are saints to to answer every single question, to comfort, to cheer, and to virtually hold hands with us. Your your service to this community is is uh, is is seen. It matters, and I'm so grateful for both of you and and who you are and what you do. Um, so. Thanks everybody, and we'll um, see you next time, hopefully next week, if not on the 23rd. Um, thanks for being here, and um, thanks for making it better. <laughs>